Now we're back in Amsterdam and we're getting ready for our next panel discussion. Uh, just one little practicality point before we start. Um, some of the questions that came up this morning were quite detailed. And I was told by the IASA drones team that if some of these questions are asked in the technical workshops tomorrow afternoon, then in fact you'll be able to get answers that maybe weren't possible in this particular round. So please store up those questions. We also still have them in the Slido tool and can look at them for then. Moving straight on now to the next panel, future operations, more complex operations. This will be led by Rachel Deschler, who has just sat down at the moment when she could just stand up, and, um, and she's our certification director at EASA. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Janet. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's quite a challenge to be the first panel after the, the lunch break, but uh, we will do our best uh, collectively. So. Uh, we have now in Europe and uh, in some other regions of the world a regulatory framework that um, enables uh, already a wide variety of range of drone operations. As we have seen uh, in panel one, there is uh, still uh, a lot to do on the implementation side. Uh, but at the same time, we have also uh, many uh, even more complex development projects, as we have also seen this morning with uh, Airbus and um, uh, Lilium keynote speeches. Uh, for this type of, of more complex operations, um, the, the regulatory framework is still to be defined and there are many open questions. Just to name a few of them, what should be uh, the target safety levels that we want to, uh, to achieve for, uh, for example, um, urban air mobility operations involving carriage of passengers? Uh, how should the ground infrastructure look like? Um, what ground infrastructure is actually needed? One for each type of product, or do we need a lot of commonality? How do we determine social acceptance for this type of new operations? Uh, many, uh, many open questions. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce you today to, uh, to our panel members, uh, we, who will discuss together with you uh, on those issues. First of all, we have Mildred Trogeller from Boeing. Welcome, Mildred. Mildred, you are Director of Global Airspace Integration for Boeing Next, which is um, a Boeing uh, entity working on the urban air mobility uh, concept. Then we have uh, Jan Hendrik Bullens from Volocopter. Jan Hendrik is a Chief Technology Officer and Managing Director at Volocopter, which is a startup company based um, in Germany, working on the urban air mobility vehicle uh, development. We have also the pleasure of having Eduardo Dominguez Puerta from Airbus. Eduardo is a senior vice president for urban air mobility at Airbus and CEO of the entity Airbus Mobility. We have also Eurocontrol, Mike Lisson. Welcome. Mike is the head of the ARPAS uh, unit uh, in, uh, in Eurocontrol. Then we have uh, Aéroport de Paris, Sébastien Couturier, Head of Innovation at Aéroport de Paris, and um, uh, having recently initiated the Urban Air Mobility Program of the organization. Welcome, Sébastien. And finally, last but not least, we have uh, Rohit uh, Kumar uh, from City of Toulouse. And uh, Rohit will explain to us uh, the role of uh, or the perspective of a city. So, um, yeah, each of our panelists will, uh, will have a chance to say a few words before we move to a, a more interactive discussion. I propose we start with, uh, with ladies and uh, with Mildred. Mildred, can you tell us a bit more uh, about what Boeing is doing in the area? Thank you, Rachel. Yes, um, so I work for Boeing Next. Boeing Next is leading the company's effort to define the future of mobility. And we are looking at the future of mobility in a way that we believe it's not enough just to produce a safe and reliable ecosystem. But we think it's even more important to really work on creation of a safe and reliable 
ecosystem, including the platform. So what I mean with that is we look beyond just the platform, but also the safe integration of UAS into the airspace. And that's actually nothing new for us. This is where history starts to repeat itself. So in the 1950s, Boeing has invented a wonderful airplane, the 707. And this really fundamentally changed the way we were traveling around the world. But it wasn't about the platform itself. It was really about the ecosystem that established around the platform. And we see the same development happening in urban air mobility. Another reason why we are really looking at an ecosystem approach is safety. For us, safety is more than just sound design. It's really making sure we have safety assurance across the entire life cycle. So from building and certifying the vehicle, as well as the airspace integration part, the reliable and predictive maintenance, but also the design and the implementation of the infrastructure. So all these new technologies, they won't be introduced overnight. We really need to go through a robust development and testing process before they will see the light of the day and enter into the market. And I would like to show to you some of our recent successes. So we have designed and built and this year successfully tested the cargo air vehicle. And it's for us a great test bed that allows us to test autonomous capabilities as well as flight controls to safely integrate these vehicles one day into the airspace. We believe that the path forward is cargo and logistics first because ultimately it helps us to work hand in hand with the regulators to prove out the safety case and to unlock the regulatory requirements that we need in order to enable new UAS solutions. We have also successfully tested this year in collaboration with Aurora Flight Sciences, the passenger air vehicle. And we are working with Kitty Hawk Cora. So Kitty Hawk Cora is a very special example. They are based in California, but they have started their operations in New Zealand. They established their base there in December 2016, and from the very beginning, they kind of realized that community integration is extremely important. So they brought their first aircraft over in October 2017, and shortly after they started operating. But the way they did it is not just to collaborate with the safety authorities and with the government, but they even brought in the, the community, the local community, the Maori and just other stakeholders, business partners. They really made this project a, a national pride. And so they are operating there for more than two years, so they have a wealth of operational data. So you see, we are looking at a wide range of platform and that really allows us to share the lessons learned and to really look at our portfolio in a holistic fashion. But the platform itself, as I said, is not enough. So we need to really develop a safe ecosystem, an airspace integration system around it. With this in mind, we partnered with the AI company Spark Cognition and we um, launched a joint venture called SkyGrid. SkyGrid is the first AI and blockchain based aerial operating system and we really leveraged also their expertise in the field of cybersecurity to not only build a safe system but also a cyber secure system. We have also partnered and invested in a number of startups, Fortem Technology, Near Earth Autonomy, to also further explore um, various on ground, uh, ground and onborn detection capabilities. And we are doing much more than you just see here on the slide. We are not talking about everything in public, but we are fully committed to play an important role in this form of mobility transformation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Milad. Jan um, Henrik, Volocopter uh, so far has been showing uh, mostly one uh, or, or two uh, types of uh, products, and we have seen very nice pictures uh, recently of uh, Volocopter flying over Singapore's Marina Bay. Can you tell us a bit more about uh, where you are? 
Absolutely. So, um, yes, Volocopter, I think, is best known for its uh, iconic aircraft. Uh, I think you might have uh, seen that uh, throughout the different media in the, in the last years. Um, nevertheless, let's, let's see if we can make this work. One, two, three. Yes, there we go. Um, I think we're on the same page as, uh, as Boeing here. We agree that this is not a play about aircraft and about having the best aircraft design. Sure, that is a precondition, but this is really about creating a new ecosystem and making that work, making that operate safely. And uh, also, uh, I think uh, that was addressed just, uh, just as well, um, making it publicly accepted there as well. Those are key factors for success. So as a company, we are also um, addressing the entire value chain there. Um, that obviously uh, needs to start with having an aircraft in the first place that you can offer a service. But to actually successfully deploy a service, we need to cover um, the uh, front end to the customer. How will the customer interact with the system? How will they order the service? What will be the experience? Um, you need to address the flight operations. So we need to actually make sure um, that there is a uh, safe and efficient way to operate these aircraft. If you look at uh, current um, examples of how um, helicopter-based air taxis are operated, often the operations are not optimized. You're dropped off somewhere outside the airport and you have a huge amount of time still transitioning between where you're dropped off and actually getting to where you want to go. So operation is a key factor for success. Um, you need to integrate in existing air traffic management systems and potentially in new air traffic management systems where drones are being considered. The ground infrastructure needs to be developed, needs to be evolved to address the new requirements. And of course, finally, uh, you need to have an aircraft. So you need to design, produce and maintain uh, these, these aircraft probably in different ways um, than it has been done in the past. And I just wanted to highlight that, that yes, um, to all the people that uh, come up and say that regulations are not yet in place and we can't do this yet, uh, I would say that that is not the case. Regulation is not the issue. We've shown on several occasions that we can work with the regulators to actually fly these aircraft in a relevant environment. And uh, this is just the most recent example of what we've flown in the heart of Singapore uh, with all the permits in place to do that. And, um, well, the next topic will be that uh, people say, well, yes, but you cannot fly at airports and you cannot integrate in existing air traffic management systems. Um, so, again, uh, we believe in showing that it can be done. This is some footage from a live flight at Selatar Airport in Singapore, where you get an impression of, of what it's like um, to actually have the volocopter flying um, in a relevant environment. So. Uh, we integrated it in the whole environment of the airport there in Singapore. It's a live airport. There are other aircraft around. It's just operating like, like any other aircraft there. Um, so that is not necessarily uh, a hurdle either. And there's a pilot on board. So um, just as with, uh, with any other aircraft, uh, the pilot can interact with the environment around him. Um, again, also to show that uh, it's really about the whole value chain, um, we need to get early feedback on uh, what the infrastructure should look like on the ground. So what we did here is build up the first prototype of our infrastructure, which is uh, the Volo port that we built in cooperation with Skyports. We built a live size mock-up here in Singapore and was part of the demonstration. So thousands of people came and actually looked at it. They were inside and they gave us feedback on the design here. So again, we're getting an opportunity in a relevant environment to get very early feedback on how to design and streamline these operations. And the last but not least, I said it's not all about the aircraft, but yes, you need to have the right aircraft for the mission. And I think that is the keyword mission here. There are probably around, I heard the number today, 200 different aircraft concepts. There is a lower number that's actually flying, but I would claim that our aircraft is probably the only one that's really tailored um, for the short-range inner-city mission. Um, that, is, uh, that is something new, so we're not even in competition there with any existing types of, of aircraft like helicopters. That means it's optimized for low noise, maximum safety levels, because that is a precondition for actually going into operation there, and of course, affordable cost. 
because obviously if you're going to be uh, operating at very high cost levels, you are not going to have a scalable business and you're not going to operate, uh, be able to offer it to a substantial crowd. So that's why we believe this is the best aircraft for that mission. Thank you very much. Eduardo, how does the perfect uh, vehicle look like for, for Airbus? First of all, uh, you know, thanks uh, for having us here. Um, I don't have a presentation because Mr. Hawke uh, made the presentation this morning for those of you who were there. And I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, for me there are some messages that I would like to add uh, on top of what was said this morning from the view of Airbus. Uh, first message is uh, congratulations to all the people that are sitting around here because if we were not working together, this would never be a reality. And today it's not. But five years ago, uh, 10 years ago, some people were dreaming. And uh, now, 2019, when you see the amount of people that are here, this community, that means that this is becoming real. When you're creating a new business and a new market, and there is no regulation, there's no market. So I think this is very important uh, to, to uh, let's say, uh, highlight uh, the work that the regulators are doing. But uh, if a market is created and there is no ecosystem and all the people in that ecosystem make money, then there's no ecosystem at all. So uh, first of all, you know, we're like uh, uh, in the early aviation period. So Airbus really respects uh, Boeing as a classical competitor on a healthy market. But we also uh, acknowledge the fact that uh, usually it's not a classical competitor that kills a duopoly in a new created market. And this is why we also respect Volocopter. We saw Daniel this morning with Lilium. I think, you know, all these people are pioneers and, and it's really important to highlight, uh, highlight that. Um, I will not talk about safety in this forum, uh, but in 1960s, urban air mobility already existed until there were some crashes of helicopters in Manhattan in the Panam building and everything stopped. So we're not uh, creating anything new, we're just uh, reusing uh, some of the technologies that are coming up uh, uh, and, and reopening a new chance uh, in history to do this. It's important to, to understand as well that urban air mobility is a, a step towards sustainable commercial aviation. And if you really want to decarbonize uh, commercial aviation, you need to start introducing technologies in the smaller platforms you cannot uh, decarbonize an A380 from the first uh, go. Uh, you need to start doing that uh, on, on several steps. So um, for me, what I get out of this, uh, this conference, and you know I should thank uh, EASA actually, is a lot of energy because uh, you see that uh, this topic uh, that was just a dream uh, some years ago is uh, starting to materialize. We have first flights of people in Singapore. We have first flights uh, of, of our own products, uh, you know, you guys as well. I think that is what we should celebrate. But at the same time, I, I believe we should kill the hype. We did an analysis of the Google trends uh, in urban air mobility since 2015. You probably all know the cycles of hypes, you know. I think uh, we should be pragmatic and humble and we should all admit uh, that this is going to take some years to become a scale reality and uh, to bring an offer to our citizens. And I think, uh, uh, you know, we would contradict ourselves or we would raise too many expectations if we were not realistic enough. The other one is a message uh, more for the European community. And I think, it, you know, we have some people from the Commission here as well. I think some years ago, uh, Airbus, uh, together with EASA, uh, they were pioneers on introducing fly-by-wire in aviation. And introducing fly-by-wire in aviation was a big one. It was a big step. And uh, what that created was a certain leadership that enabled Airbus to become what is today, which is a one-to-one -one competitor of Boeing. Uh, I believe uh, autonomy and uh, electrification are the new trends for aviation. And uh, I believe that uh, with the regulators, with the industry, cooperating together with the cities and the public uh, and civic, uh, civic leadership, 
I think uh, Europe uh, should also have a certain uh, drive for leadership on autonomy, on electrification, on all these topics that are becoming more and more important for, for societal needs. And I think uh, we can do it. Uh, that's, that's an important, we need to dare, but we can do it. Um, and last uh, but not least, uh, I think uh, it was mentioned today, uh, societal acceptance. Usually it takes uh, one and a half, two generations to change a reality. And uh, the duration of generations is not our span of life. It's, uh, you know, when kids get adults and adults get older. And those cycles are between eight uh, to 10 years nowadays with globalization, with technology, with connectivity. Um, I've been cycling with my kids uh, in between uh, autonomous cars. And for them, uh, autonomy is not a fiction. It's a reality they have seen. And I believe uh, those generations uh, will have no problem uh, in the future to jump into a, an autonomous metro, like we're doing today, or an autonomous aircraft. And I think uh, when you look at uh, the complexity of the problem, um, when you look at the technological solutions we're already bringing, when we look at uh, the regulatory innovation that is happening, I think uh, very soon we need to start uh, bringing uh, things to market and we really need to start uh, highlighting the value we create for society. And unless we do so, this will never bloom and this will never flourish. And uh, I think uh, it's, it's cool to talk about technology. Now we're starting to have the frameworks. I think we need to look at market and we need to look at uh, social applications. And once we have done that, I think uh, all this uh, will enter into a new mode, uh, which is gonna be a scaling. And I hope, uh, and I, you know, I would like uh, to believe that uh, during the 2020s, that is what we're gonna bring to society. So Airbus is very proud and very humble to be part of this. Uh, we have done estimations and uh, if uh, the, for the creation of, in, of this industry and the full stack, it's probably in between 15 to 20 billion. If we all want to do that full stack together, there's gonna be a huge loss of money probably even bigger than the market that can be grasped. And I think uh, that calls for collaboration between the different companies, with regulators, with the standard groups uh, that we saw today. Because unless we work together as a community, that is gonna be too expensive for any single company to create all of this. So I think that is the spirit uh, that we want to bring. Of course, you know, our products, uh, uh, you know, we had a very successful uh, 50 kilometer flight of Vana two weeks ago. 50 kilometers flight is, is interesting because it's starting to be a mission, fully autonomous. We are, you know, uh, flight testing our city Airbus, which is more of a 2.4 ton, it's a bigger machine. We're trying to push uh, and, and understand the limits of technology, but uh, we're starting to show that this can be real, uh, like our colleagues uh, here. So very motivated as, as a company uh, to, to be part of this. Uh, very thankful uh, to all the regulators, uh, all the, the civic uh, leadership in the cities, in the commission, etc. And uh, really willing to create uh, not just uh, some gatherings, but really working groups that can bring this forward. And on that one, I also invite uh, you, know, you guys, uh, regulators, and also cities to push the different industrial companies to collaborate together because sometimes we have difficulties to do so. And I, as I tend to say, before there's a race, uh, there's no competitors. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we know that we will compete in the long term. And sometimes uh, we should overcome that lack of trust, uh, essentially at the very beginning. And then we will be able to compete in the long term. So I think those are the messages that I wanted to share with you. Uh, they are maybe not as cool as the videos that were shown this morning, but I think they are equally important. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eduardo, and congratulations for the for the Vana flight. 50 kilometers is quite a, quite a distance. So. Um, Mike, um, one one of the challenge we will have to solve uh, is uh, integration uh, into the airspace, and that's what you have been working on: integration of drones into airspace. How far do you think we are from? Um, uh, integration of drones uh, in airspace that would be shared with manned aviation and also how do you see 
uh, airspace issues for urban air mobility. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, if I knew I had this question, I might think twice about it because it, it's not going to be a nice answer on this perspective. Um, they say this is a bit of a kind of a disruptive technology. And if I look at, uh, we've started this whole story in the time that Luke Tietgat was still my boss in, uh, in, in Eurocontrol and way before that time as even as well. You can see that there is a lot of maturity coming in the aspects, but in principle it remains the same part as the ATM CNS perspective, which we, from an operational perspective, are addressing. And we are looking at the foundation of things. Some of the foundations are still simply not in place. And although we hear a lot of new terms like use space and, and the Internet of Things, it boils down to the basics. Now, on the basics parts, we still don't have flight rules for the small ones. So the interaction part on right of way is not there, the detect and avoid. So the list is already well known to everybody on that side. So I think from a full integration perspective, we are just starting. But there is a lot of possibilities already by creating geographical zones, if you want to call them like this, where we have the possibility for drones, unmanned helicopters and all these things to start and to start collecting data. We've started collecting data to the EU drone network of demonstrators now to see what actually is happening in Europe to get a good picture. And there are not actually a lot of data getting, we're getting back and the numbers are actually quite low. And it shows you how difficult it actually is to do beyond visual line of sight because on the technical part you have the radio line of sight issues. The 4G part, we've been involved in the demos with um, Podium and also developing the chorus part. There also you show that there are a huge amount of technology ideas that are available, but not mature yet to do these things. So for us, the core of the work starts at looking at a piece of airspace, which is nothing new. That is something we have done for manned aviation for a very long time. So our vision is to first analyze the airspace where you want to operate the drones, which could be an airport, which we've done now in the CTR of Riga. We finished that job. And we basically said, we're gonna look at the air risks and we're going to look at all the ground risk, and that will give us a good understanding of the whole volume and what is actually happening in that airspace and all the risks before we can make decisions what requirements we need, what kind of services are actually needed to make this work, or actually come to the conclusion simply cannot happen here. So that actually means that you have to analyze the real tracks of the aircraft departing from Riga Airport. So not the standard departures and arrivals, but actually really tracking the part. And you can see the deviations in altitude and track deviations, which basically made it possible for us to create an area around the airport where we don't want them to operate, because now we know exactly where they're there. If you're looking at the AIP, which already is for, for aeronautical people, kind of the Bible that we have per state, for non-aviation people, very difficult to read. But there, if you look in that part, there are VFR routes in that part. So we said, okay, these routes, we should protect even more from drones. And then you start talking to the pilots and they actually say, well, we actually don't use them. So we actually built the real picture of what is really happening there from the airspace perspective. But also talk to drone operators, the military, you name them. <coughs> then came the big part, ground risks. Moy, we were in for a treat. Because we thought, okay, we're going to talk to some non-aviation entities and we estimated it to be 15 maybe. There were slightly more of that. So we actually started, let's have a talk to the Port Authority, for instance. And the Port Authority actually owns a huge part of the ground inside Riga City, so actually also has a say on what's happening on that side. We found out that flying drones close to large metal ships actually is not working at all because they crash all the time. They have primary radars, they have long range antennas for search and rescue actions. So we actually started building up that picture and we ended up with huge amount of data, unfortunately. And we basically gridded the airspace in the CTR by 300 by 300 meters, basically based on the VLOS perspective of life. And there we actually came to the conclusion that we have more than 60 entities that should provide us with data and maintain the data, just like the council. So we talk to councils, okay, what is your legal boundary? On the, on the map, this is the boundary. So you don't want to still fly over your legal property. That is correct, but this is a marsh. Okay, you can take that out. So the marsh was taken out. But it also means that the data we have there from the airspace and we don't want you to fly over the city or we need to give you a special approval needs to be maintained. So you can see on the aeronautical data part, we have our normal quite a large amount of data coming in, and all of a sudden we have interactions with non-aviation people, 
that should provide the data, then the question comes, is this going to be aeronautical data, yes or no? And if it's yes, then we're talking about terabytes. And this is just one CTR. But now we have done the analysis, we have a good look of this part, so now the next phase will be the airspace design part. And that's the part where, unfortunately, we are still in the beginning of the industry, because there I would need the drone operators, the manufacturers, to tell me, we want to operate there, because then you can start designing the airspace. But then you can start also talking to a lot of other entities like police and all the elements to bring in there. So it's, it's a start of a journey. In the end, we want to have an, an airspace design manual that will guide states and also cities, like urban air mobility part, to this part, but also for the urban air mobility, have a very close look at the airspace you want to operate. Because there are many elements in there that actually disrupt your flight. And apart from that, I think also public acceptance will also play a very big role in that part. This is just a part of what we're doing, but I think this is enough, I think, for now to park the discussion, I hope. Thank you very much, Mike, for adding a little bit on the complexity and, and the challenges. Uh, Sébastien from uh, Aéroport de Paris. Um, what is the perspective of a uh, big, large airport group on uh, urban air mobility? Do you see a market in the Paris region for urban air mobility? And are there any particular challenges in this region? Okay, hello, everyone. First of all, thank you for having me in this panel, because I don't think a lot of airports have been uh, invited or you don't hear the voice of the airport at this point in time of, on this, this technology. I mean, not that much. Uh, I'm assuming that in the, the next couple of years, a lot of airports will be uh, on the panels. Why is that? Because I, I believe, we strongly believe that, of course, the first value offer of airport is being playground for those type of technologies. And uh, the second point is that there are specific playgrounds with a lot of security issues, uh, with a lot of redundancy systems, with a lot of uh, stakeholders uh, like uh, firemen, uh, uh, tower control, uh, radar systems. And I think if you want to launch something uh, regarding all the topics that have been mentioned in terms of difficulties, uh, some airports and some s uh, airport systems can be uh, really the first playground. I don't believe that we will see in the next couple of years uh, VTOL flying around Paris uh, from the Arc de Triomphe to the Opera. Uh, it's very nice in terms of image, uh, in terms of perspective, but we, we strongly believe in suburban uh, possibilities. We strongly believe that we can use the helicopter industry and what have been achieved. Uh, avoiding to reinvent everything. And uh, we strongly believe that we, can, we have to prove and um, execute in some way um, um, use cases that are aligned with a real market. Because uh, at the end of the day, there's passengers that are willing to pay. So um, please use airport are as playground and also as big uh, places where you can make survey on what passengers are expecting. We did a survey uh, on 1,000 passengers. Uh, are you willing to uh, try this new mode of transport? 65% yes. Um, how much are you willing to pay for that? Um, somewhere around a, a motor taxi or a bit above, <clears throat> let's say. Uh, just for instance, in Charles de Gaulle, it's 1,000 motor taxi per day. Roughly. Um, are you fearing of this technology? 48% are saying uh, no, which means 52 are saying, uh, yes, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm fearing this technology, so we, ha we have to work on this topic. Of course, it depends the way if you ask the question, etc. But there is a real potential, and we don't see this uh, uh, technology as a mass transit transport. Uh, at, for short and mid-term, of course. For us, it's really a, a, a complementary way of transportation. And as you know, one of the pain points is how do I get out of this airport and how do I go to the airport? Uh, Besides Schiphol, I think for the rest of the airports, it's very complicated in the world. Um, so very quickly, because I have two free slides, just to uh, uh, 
uh, summarize it because Group ADP is not very well known in terms of international footprint. This is just to say that we are not working only in Paris, but we do operate airports throughout the world, or we do make co conception of airports uh, throughout the world. And this is very important because we don't look at UAM only for the Parisian market, but also abroad. We have offices in Hong Kong, in New York, in Dubai, and this is important to see where the market, market is, uh, is going <coughs> and who will be the first mover. Uh, if I focus on the Paris region, um, we want to take advantage, to be clear, on the fact that we have the assets around the Paris region. It's one of the only cases in Europe where you, you manage the same entity, manage the three big airports, Paris Charles de Gaulle, Paris Orly, Paris Le Bourget, and 11 aerodromes around Paris. And when I'm th um, speaking about suburban routes, we can work, try to work on hotspots regarding this, uh, this map. Um, of course, uh, we have a meth kind of methodology uh, that we have developed on site selection. So you see just a summarize of five items of them. Uh, just imagine that there is 55 items or 60 items beside those five bullet points. It's just that we need to have this type of methodology to identify where is the best spot technically in terms of market, in terms of operation, in terms of airspace configuration. And I think that airport can be an enabler to help the industry identify the, the right spots. And uh, finally, this is just a, a picture behind that you see a, a vertiport designed by IDP, but my point is that we, all the, the topics you see, the 10 or 11 topics, is just a, a behind the scene work that we will have to do uh, as an airport operator to connect all the process from each uh, other, uh, B2B process, and of course, B2C experience. Just think about uh, the security for the passengers uh, we need to know if those people will be safe in terms of security. How will, we will use biometrics. You will have to control the passengers. Very few people talk about these topics. How do we going to work? We're talking about airport. Luggage issue. First issue for every passenger. So how does it work? Does it, go, does it fit in the vehicle? Or do we f have to find a specific process on the ground to go to the city, et cetera, et cetera? And again, I think airport can really help on that uh, big journey. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We need to come back to the manufacturers for the luggage uh, question later. Um, Rohit from city of Toulouse, thank you very much for being here. And you, um, you really wanted me to ask you the question of why a city in this panel? Thank you. First of all, thanks a lot to Yaja, inviting a city. That's the first part. And second part, we are just one year old. If you talk, for me, UM is not aviation, it's a urban mobility. But even if you say aviation, we are just one year old. That's the first part. Secondly, I'm not just representing Toulouse here. I'm representing a group of 42 cities who are trying to explore the third dimension of urban mobility. How we are willing, how we can integrate it. So before I start my presentation, I would like to share what is urban air mobility for a city. I know everybody is having a different opinion. I would like to utilize this uh, particular platform to share. And I used to say one simple thing to everybody. You have a driving license. Have you faced any problem in the Europe to drive your car? The answer is no. Till the date, we are not complete. Whether you talk vehicle, where you talk policy, where you talk use space, where you talk uh, emergency landing pad. So even everything is 100% certified, 10 to power minus 9. And there is no emergency landing pad in the city. Sorry to say, we cannot integrate. We are not ready. That's what city thinks about the urban air mobility. If you are doing something without complete ecosystem, for us, it's just an application of drone, whether you can do the forest inspection or railway inspection. So this is B612 UM is the last initiative that we launched yesterday. So that's why it is here. We will talk about it. But before we talk about the urban air mobility, 
I would like to share what ecosystem we are talking about the urban mobility. Nothing is free there, and there is a risk. Even it is solving a problem, for an example, but we can't afford to have problem because of those drones. Because it's just not about thinking about the climate change, but it's also important to think about the life we are putting on the risk. So we have to take care of everything. And with the Toulouse, I can say that we are working from the autonomous ground vehicle to utilize the satellite data to improve the mobility overall. That's what our vision is. If we talk about the urban air mobility, thanks to one person sitting over there, Wesley Agoridas, who brought Toulouse in the map of urban air mobility. And nobody will surprise that city is having no knowledge about the technology and how this whole system look like. For four months, around four, almost five months, we worked with 35 partners, and as Adrado said, there's a difficulties that two industries should work together. And uh, so that was that the task Toulouse Metropole did. We worked with 35 partners to build a story. Whether you talk about the UTM, two person want to bring UTM, can you work together? Yes, it is possible. Because right now it's a blue ocean. It's not the red ocean. So everybody needs to work together. We built a very wonderful uh, project. We identified the huge cases. We identified the technology but how to get money, because this initiative was non-funded. We had another headache. And then we had a project, or we already won this project, Villagil project, it's a 10-year big project, and we started working on this in 2017 with a mindset of urban mobility, future urban mobility, without thinking anything about the urban air mobility. But we were ready in fab. So we wanted to integrate it, and we visited many, multiple partners, because can anybody accept the challenge to be the key integrator for the city of Toulouse? And thanks to Airbus that they accepted our challenge. And everybody's surprised that the urban mobility project got dominated with urban air mobility. After that, from the September, the question was how we all can work together. Not the Toulouse ecosystem, but when I visited the Yaja regulatory workshop there, and from there, the idea comes, B612 year marketplace. So I would like to talk about what we are trying to see in the village. For Toulouse, or, or for any city, the future uh, mobility or urban mobility is about the mobility, it's about the energy, and it's about the data. And we cannot afford to test all those things inside the city. So under village, Toulouse is willing to develop a future test center the time spent is 10 years. We'll start developing slowly. We can finish before, why not? But we are not in hurry. The yellow part will be dedicated to the autonomous vehicle. The blue part will be dedicated to the urban air mobility part. The red part will be dedicated to the energy, which can support both. And then the purple part will going to support the intermodality. And the orange part will going to support the overall ecosystem. This, the, our thought is very, very clear. First test here, are we all ready? And then use it as a public acceptance. And then start doing something in the city. So I, will, I, I will skip this uh, slide very fast. So we tried to uh, link everything to, uh, to the medical use cases and divided all type of drone operation you can think about a drone taxi uh, 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 to the medical, whether the inspection or the delivery or the drone ambulance. And we want to do it by 2030. But when we will do it, we, 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 will, we will be ready with all the part and, uh, under the ecosystem. So why we launched yesterday, the, the thought, is, thought was very simple behind the B612 UM Innovation Marketplace. Everybody in this room is having some missing block. Investor need a project, city need a solution and money, startup need a money and demand. So we need to complete our uh, missing block by working together. And then do demo, deploy, and scale. And for the Toulouse, this is our timeline. So with, in this marketplace, we want to invite everybody to join us and uh, to build their future plan 
and work together. It's easy, you can go to the website, this uh, B612UM, and you can join us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ho. It's a very interesting example of how a city can be uh, driving a, a very innovative uh, project uh, with such complexity. I, I would like to come back to, um, uh, to the problematic of the ecosystem. Uh, for um, urban air mobility to really become reality, what we are seeing is that it's a whole new ecosystem that needs to be built and to be operational. Uh, we need um, a certified vehicle with, with adequate performance, we need ground infrastructure, we need a regulatory framework, we need probably local authorizations, uh, we need to, to think about the operator, the pilot, licensing, training, airspace integration, social acceptance, and, and also um, business model. Uh, is there a positive business model? So my, my question to the panel would be, um, how, uh, considering the number of actors and stakeholders uh, involved, which is potentially huge, um, what would be good ways to move forward? Uh, who should be in the lead for the building of such an ecosystem? Is, is it the city? Is it the aircraft manufacturer? What kind of cooperation do we need to, uh, to enable it? Who would like to, to try first? Uh, maybe Eduardo? <laughs> it's a big question. Uh, but I, I think we were mentioning everybody here. I think uh, there needs to be uh, uh, local corporations because, uh, like for mobility solutions, uh, they, they serve local communities. But there needs to be uh, national and, and uh, in this case, European regulations. And we need to treat uh, all those uh, all those elements. I, you know, I, I go around the world and I talk to a lot of majors and a lot of uh, politicians and. And everybody's telling me, uh, Eduardo, this shouldn't be a, a toy for rich people. And I agree, but uh, at the same time, I recall everybody that uh, the first car was a toy for rich people. The first bicycle was a toy for rich people. The first mobile phone, a smartphone, was a toy for rich people. And then you had the, the law, Moore's law and, and the scaling, industrial scaling that, uh, that grew up. Um, I think drones uh, will pave the way and I think medical uses uh, are very well understood by public uh, opinion, and they see the value of it. Like, uh, like you said, uh, you know, uh, if anybody is uh, dreaming of replacing the whole ground infrastructure and transport infrastructure that exists, that's typically wrong. I think we're, we're bringing a new lever uh, to public transportation uh, with a different set of characteristics. And uh, the key question to all of this is uh, how much will need to be funded and how long for all that to happen. And I don't want to be uh, you know, pessimistic, but if you think about the genesis of aviation, uh, there were probably 200 pioneers with 200 architectures. And uh, when you look at aviation today, there was a huge uh, consolidation uh, that happened in terms of uh, manufacturers. But if you look at airlines, there has been the same type of consolidation by regions in the different places in the world. So I think this, the story will repeat a bit itself. And I think uh, uh, indifference to commercial aviation or to helicopter market as of today, there's going to be B2G business opportunities. And I, I can see uh, uh, schemes where cities uh, contract uh, companies like metro lines, like, uh, you know, uh, transportation, buses, uh, et cetera, to bring that uh, air dimension. That can, be, that can be a way, maybe in some countries. In some other countries, I see a classical uh, manufacturer operator model uh, coming up. And I see also some companies try to enter and to open the market through the tourism and the sightseeing, uh, which is also a, a usage uh, that some people, some people understand. What is the magic formula? What is the right order to do things? I think uh, nobody knows, uh, and, uh, but I think if we think together, we will find a way. And at the end of the day, more importantly, the people will tell us uh, what is good and what is not good. Voila. Thank you very much.
So uh, I, I think there is no magic formula. Uh, I think it's really um, first to recognize, as you rightfully said, that each city, each country is a unique case. There are countries where public transportation is clearly privatized, and there are other places in the world where that is not the case. So I think we have to deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis, identify who are the relevant stakeholders, and actually, um, I would say, forge a coalition of the willing, if you will, uh, and actually, in any particular scenario, identify who are the relevant players. You will typically need uh, the air navigation service providers. If, if you're going to offer a service from an airport, um, to the city center or in the uh, suburban areas, you might want to work together with the, the airport of Paris or uh, uh, you, you might want to have them on the team in order to implement that. So it really is going to depend on what you are doing. Um, I don't think there is a magic formula of saying who should be the, um, uh, the actors in such a coalition. Yeah, I agree there is not a magical formula. And But what I think where I see a common approach is rather than talking about who takes the lead, I think it's going to be a collaboration between the industry, the community, and ultimately also the regulator. And I think two of the biggest obstacles that I see if we are looking at the ecosystem is definitely social acceptance <coughs> and the universal regulatory unlocks. And I think the way to address this is really working in regulatory sandboxes, hand in hand with the regulators and also bringing in the community to slowly pave the way for social acceptance. I have a little uh, different uh, opinion, sorry. <laughs> City is in the lead, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Thanks for highlighting the two points. I was about to talk that. You said we have two problems, regulation, and social acceptance. I'm super confident about the IAJA. Today or tomorrow, they are going to come up with a super strict uh, regulation that everything is safe. How we, how we started, and I think how everybody should start. In January 2018, I was not even that time the part of Toulouse Metropol. We organized a working session with 350 citizens in five cities. And we asked this question. It was also about the autonomous vehicle. But we asked about the drone. What's your opinion? And two things come up in a majority. The first thing, I only trust the local authority. I won't use it if a, pub, a private company is coming and do, giving the service for the first time. Second time, I'm fine. And the second time, and second thing which came up with the 85% majority, medical case, I'm fine. Because today it's you, tomorrow it will be me. So to start with, we need to not to go sell something and to start doing the demonstration or deployment. For it, it could be it could be done by the any industrialist. Hold a, like this uh, for the citizen and hear them out, and you will get the answer. Who should be leading in that particular city or globally? And I believe most of the people trust. If you talk about the mobility, is the a city or the local authority who are running that? If I can comment on the public acceptance, because uh, I think we're probably all in agreement that this is going to be one of the key enablers in order to make this happen. Um, we have used the different demonstrations which we've performed around the world to gather data on, on public acceptance. Um, one positive bit of news there is that people have been more open to this new mode of transportation than we would have expected. Um, generally, they tend to perceive this as a, uh, let's say, um, an upgrade of their city, so as a way of uh, showing that their city is at the forefront of innovation, which, which certainly helps in implementing such a thing. Um, I think noise is the main constraint, or is the main uh, worry that you have, because um, I, I, I've heard that, well, we should focus on medical applications, emergency medical services, because you know, if you're saving lives, people will tolerate it. And I think this is completely wrong. I don't think that is the case. Uh, I think if you look at rescue helicopters today, if they're flying over a city, they're landing on the hospital, the people that are in the flight path of this helicopter, they will still call when the helicopter is flying, even if it's saving lives, and they will, go, they will complain about the noise levels. So I think saving lives is not going to prevent us from having to deal with public acceptance. Um, at the same time, there is this, uh, this nice example. Uh, we we did the public flight in Singapore, 
What most people don't know is that there was another flight the day before where we did a dry run. Nobody even noticed that. So there were people walking by the Marina Bay area. They were going about their business. We were flying around. Nobody posted videos of that. Nobody talked about it. Nobody called anybody and complained about the noise levels. So to me, that is the ultimate proof of public acceptance. If we can actually show that people just go about their business and they don't even notice it. I would like to just ask one question. Why there is no video of accident of drone? Why only the success videos are on LinkedIn? If public, there is a car accident video everywhere, right? Why there, if you are so sure that citizens are okay, why there is no publicity of a drone accident? Not, not sure I understand the question. The question is like, if, if you think that people are okay with this thing, like if there is a car accident or aircraft accident, there is a publicity, like you get the video, you go to the YouTube, you find everything. But if you talk about the drone or the drone taxi, even if there is some accident, nobody is sharing that video or publicizing that this is normal. Let's, let's talk about uh, a little bit, if, if you agree, about the, the safety uh, aspect and, and uh, what kind of, of uh, safety level, safety targets we should aim at for uh, urban air mobility. Uh, today, in, in transportation, we have um, a variety of, of safety performance that we can observe, which, which is different whether you look at commercial aviation or you look at, at car transportation or uh, ground public transportation, train or bus, etc. Uh, what what is uh, your uh, approach to uh, to the safety problematic? What what targets should we set for, for example, carrying passengers uh, over cities? I don't know who, who would like to take that first. Um, um. At the end, we are we are the OEMs, so somehow we're we're the ones manufacturing. Huh? Uh, you know, I think uh, there is uh, the usage and the frequency of flights. And uh, I personally believe that uh, we need to come to a level of uh, safety uh, that is uh, today at the level of commercial aviation where high frequencies are there, uh, high number of passengers, uh, because uh, today uh, the safety requirements for other products with uh, less of a usage in terms of flying hours, uh, they might be a bit uh, lower. Uh, and maybe it's a hurdle at the beginning and maybe we need redundant systems uh, that will increase weight and will impede the economics. Uh, but I believe it's a good approach. I think we should put the bar very high. Uh, and if it takes time to pass by, fine. You know, we'll take the time and we'll do it safely. Uh, I also recall uh, the safety factors of uh, some other type of autonomous systems that are, you know, like autonomous metros in cities. And I think 10 to the minus nine uh, comes as, uh, as a number in some cases. And I don't know if any of you has, has been transported in an autonomous metro. Usually, psychologically, it's okay because you, you tend to believe that there is somebody driving. You don't see it. Uh, but actually, that shows a, a, a social mental threshold. Huh? And I believe uh, that, uh, that we should strive for higher safety limits than lowering the bar. And, you know, if we go back to, to, to the eVTOL special condition or the approach uh, that is taken in the U.S., uh, basically using Part 23 uh, as a different uh, base, I think at some stage we will need to lift it up uh, and to align. Because uh, if we really want to make uh, economics out of this type of systems, you will need high frequencies. Uh, high frequencies above uh, urban areas, uh, I think uh, we, should, uh, we should strive for a high level of safety. And this is where I say, uh, you know, the experimenting, the experiencing, the demonstrations is really great. But uh, I think, uh, you know, regulators are, are, are going to uh, ask that because that is what, uh, what is going to protect uh, society. And at the end of the day, that is what is going to protect the business itself. Right? So sometimes, uh, even if it takes longer, it's better. That's my view. Thank you. Any diverging view on the safety aspect? <laughs> I can only concur actually on this part to lay the bar high because if you have the bar high it's easier to reduce it than doing the other way around. The other part is where we are facing is where we're facing the unmanned transport and if I look at just the part where I'm chairing the air parse panel in ICAO we're looking at IFR and we are writing hundreds of SARPs at the moment uh, 
the nightmare for IKEA would be to take the human out of the loop. That actually means writing, rewriting 19 annexes, and I think then my pension will be over 45 years or something like that. So that's going to be even a bigger challenge, I would say. But I think starting with the human there to bring it up, I think it's okay. I mean, I, I feel a bit in this panel a bit like Bob the Builder. Uh, you guys come up with these wonderful things and we need to try to find solutions. Ayasa on the regulatory side and we on the operational side. I, I emphasize again and again and again, and it's the same for the urban and mobility part. Look at your environment where you need to operate. You have a very in interesting vision. The reality of the vision is based on where you are able to operate or not, and that forms your business case, and that is something I think also with the urban air mobility people that is mostly missing sometimes, and it's a very good vision and a step forward. But I think the reality, bringing that reality in and really looking at the added value, I think that it's important. I mean, you have no problem in supporting people there, looking at the environment you want to work in, but for me, Specifically for my unit, it has to be added value because otherwise we are spread all over the case. And what we see now is the scope is constantly changing. When I started, it was UAVs. It was the big ones. And within Eurocontrol, they're going to be around the corner, thousands of them within a couple of months. And then the reality kicked in. And then all of a sudden we're called RPAS. And then UES was there, UTM, USPACE, UEM. And it constantly, constantly causing instability in, in moving forward on that part because you constantly are moving around all the time. Mm -hmm. So, Just, just to, uh, to put the record straight there, um, because uh, we are not, at least for Volocopter at this point in time, not talking about autonomous flight. Oh. Our aircraft has a pilot in it, exactly for the reason of not having to deal with changing all these regulations. Um, so that we can actually go to service uh, before you retire, hopefully. <laughs> that, that is our plan. So we don't just have a vision, we have a plan, which is the vision plus a schedule and a budget, and then we get very close to a plan. And um, I, I think just coming back to the safety, um, I think the safety here is a precondition for doing business. Um, the main point here is to have a level playing field. So I think it's very good for EASA to set the playing field, to set the bar at a certain level, and it, it's up to us to find, uh, find out how we will jump the hurdle. Um, but the level playing field, also at an international level, I think is very important to have in place. If, we can, uh, if we're certifying aircraft today, whether it's you know, a large airliner or a helicopter, typically uh, we have a relatively level playing field for certifying these things. Of course, ideally, we would like to see a situation where it would be possible to have also a level playing field internationally for certifying electric vehicles and air taxis there as well. Sebastian? Yes, uh, just one remark about the survey uh, I was mentioning. Uh, if 60% are willing to try air taxi, in their mind is uh, piloted. Because if you ask the same question saying is unmanned, it's less than 20%. So it's a vision based on the pragmatic uh, steps. Yeah. For, uh, again, little <laughs> normal. For city, what I observed in last one year, when we, whenever we talked about the safety or certification, we always talk either about the vehicle or about one system. But it is very important that when we talk about the regulation or safety, we need to talk about the global. Overall, it's okay that one block is certified or safe, but are we working toward that, that we can say this whole block is certified together? And not only for the air and the aviation, because for uh, imagine like what trial we are going to do in the test center, that autonomous vehicle is going on the ground and the autonomous drone going in the air, and there will be communication regarding the safety. So you just not have to consider the safety from the aviation, but from the other part also. Yeah, so we, we need to look at safety with a global perspective and, and to look at all the, the, the segments of, of, of the operation. Uh, let me ask a question now about the, the ground uh, infrastructure. Uh, there are tens, uh, more than 100 uh, projects in development for, for VTOL uh, design, and, and to me, they all uh, look quite different. And, and, uh, uh, my question is, are we going to see as many uh, ground stations or ground or vertiports as, as types of, of VTOLs? I think Volocopter, you are, you are developing your own uh, standard or, or, or your own uh, uh, 
uh, vertiport. Uh, do we need interoperability and how do we achieve that? Ideally, sure, we need interoperability. I think the electric car industry has taken some time to figure out what is the right type of connector for, for charging a car. And I'm, I'm not sure if by now they've, they've figured it out or they're still trying to find out what, what is the right solution. Um, I would take a pragmatic approach on this and say we need to start somewhere. And if that means that the infrastructure is compatible with one aircraft and not with another, then that is a way to start. In the longer term, definitely, uh, I cannot see any city uh, dedicating um, an infrastructure just to one manufacturer indefinitely. So I think, yes, we need to work on standardization of that infrastructure. There are already working groups on the way working on, on what those requirements could look like. And um, Volocopter is actively contributing to that. Any other view on, on the yeah, I think there is a, a, the first need is economical sustainability in terms of infrastructure. I mean, we cannot come to uh, our board saying that we are going to build a small airport for VTOL uh, uh, near the terminals. I mean, it's, it's going to be very complicated because the capacity that we are in, we can imagine it, will not cover 1% uh, of the cost. So um, uh, on this topic, I think we, for two points. First, we need a sandbox to really try and experiment and try to co-create regulation with the um, people in charge of regulation. That's our first offer. And I think it's complementary to the, uh, to the point of, of what Toulouse is doing. Uh, we will announce in the starting uh, 2020 uh, sandbox in the, in the Paris region for uh, manufacturers that, that want to, to try and, and uh, in the Paris region because we have a specific uh, uh, area of flying, etc. But we want to try everything, including the passenger experience, which is a, a key issue again in terms of sec safety and security aspects. Uh, this is the first point, and the, the second point would be um, I just forget it, but um, I'll try to recover it. Um, probably that uh, in terms of, um, of uh, um, uh, amount that uh, a client is ready to pay, we, we need to find the, really the, the right balance between uh, the investment cost from the industry that is producing the vehicles, the cost of the infrastructure, and what the economic model looks like at the end. We have some assumptions. Uh, we know what's, it's, what's happening in terms of aircraft. Uh, but I agree with uh, uh, Eduardo when he said that we are kind of pioneering the, in the industry, so we will have to be very um, enthusiastic and perseverant to, to onboard our boards, <laughs> uh, because uh, I come from a brick and mortar industry, and uh, the economic model is not simple at all. Thank you for that. Uh, we have 22 minutes left now on the panel. I propose we, we take now some of the audience uh, questions through, uh, through the Slido. If we can get them uh, on display. With the safety requirements highlighted in SCVTOL and the 10 minus 9 requirements, will EVTOLs actually be cheap, cheaper than small helicopters, or will they cost 1 million? And uh, I would add, are they actually uh, technologically uh, feasible with the technology we have today? So, shall I, shall I take a swing at it? Um, <laughs> I think. Um, it's definitely not making them cheaper. Um, at the same time, uh, we just discussed before uh, the importance of safety levels for doing business. So if, if we accept that this is the hurdle that we need to jump, that we need to get across, then that is a given. Um, I think throughout the, throughout the life cycle of the aircraft, um, 10 to the minus 9 or minus whatever you want is not a major uh, contributor to the overall cost during the entire life cycle and not to the operating cost of a single flight. I think there are other factors in the, uh, um, in the equation that are contributing far, far heavier to the operating cost of such an aircraft. Um, then certifying something to 10 to the minus 9, that's a one-time cost, it's not a recurring cost. 
Um, so it's not about the cost of the aircraft, it's about the cost of the operations. That's what's critical here. And um, I think that, I hope that answers the question. Thanks. Uh, why don't companies like Volocopter, Airbus and Boeing start scaling up operations and building infrastructure using certified helicopters and licensed crews? Uh, I think that's for Airbus, yeah. I mean, we're doing. Actually, if you heard properly this morning, and if you want to fly an, on a helicopter and have uh, urban air mobility experience, uh, you can already do that in Sao Paulo, you can already do that in, in Mexico City, you can do it in San Francisco, and very soon, uh, you know, in, in, in China. Um, I think that is a very good learning, uh, to understand uh, passengers' feedback, also from the different uh, manufacturers, because we're not just uh, flying our own helicopters, that we know very well, but we also get feedback about the rest of the, of, uh, of the helicopters. And I think that is also a very interesting way uh, to, to, to activate the whole ecosystem. Yeah, we talked about uh, VFR, IFR, I mean, how to, uh, how to understand demand, uh, how to understand patterns, uh, how to understand the economical model. The difficulty is that uh, uh, the helicopters are, uh, for me, wonderful machines. Uh, I call them a jack of all trades. I think they are very versatile. Uh, they are used for a lot of things. And uh, what we're seeing now is that uh, uh, with the EV tolls, the machines are much more tailored to a single mission. And that creates a different architecture, and that's going to create a different uh, cost structure. Uh, uh, there are also regulations that impact uh, the economics of flying people with helicopters over cities, uh, like a single engine versus a twin engine, and those are safety, safety requirements. So um, this is what we're doing. Uh, we believe that uh, you know, our helicopters uh, have been the pioneers of urban air mobility, really, not just the oil and gas and so on. They are already transporting people. They are already performing medical missions. And uh, for us, uh, this has been, uh, uh, let's say, a duel of learning uh, and also a duel of uh, inspiration for the future machines. The other thing that I would like to highlight or disclose is uh, uh, electrification and noise are no one-to-one -one correlated. And uh, even uh, electrification, uh, you know, is going to change a lot of things in terms of architectures. It's not going to change a lot of things in terms of aerodynamics. And a lot of the, the noise uh, source is coming from the aerodynamics themselves. Maybe the frequency of the noise is going to be different, and then you enter into the amount of, of blades, uh, the, the omega of the blades, and more technical things. But uh, I, I think that is also something that uh, we are today performing with uh, our colleagues in Paris, uh, tests on noise using helicopters. And I think that is a very complementary way to, to enable that transition. So yes, we're doing, that's the answer. Yes, and also to answer from a Boeing perspective, I fully agree with everything you have said. It's an obvious use case we are also looking at, and it's also a stepping stone towards further scaling operation, helps to test the ecosystem with respect to noise. It's also an interesting case because it really allows us also to detect where are noise-sensitive areas in a certain urban environment. It also allows us to, to really see how actual operations are working where the obstacles where we need, still need to work on. So I think that's, that's definitely an obvious use case. So I think the last part of the question was, why doesn't Volocopter do this? Three reasons, noise, safety, cost. Those are the reasons why we're not doing that. Noise was just discussed. We strongly believe that helicopters today are too noisy to perform this mission, at least in larger scale. Um, I think all the operations that are existing today are either in places where noise is not considered the biggest issue they are dealing with, or noise uh, or number of flight movements are restricted severely to very few per day, which doesn't make it a viable business. So that's noise. Safety, we're always comparing against a single engine turbine. That would be, from a cost perspective, the only viable option. Doing air taxi with twin engine helicopters today, I don't think is a viable business proposition at least not at the cost levels that we're targeting. And three, costs. Um, helicopters today are extremely expensive to operate. I'm not sure if anybody that's offering this air mobility service with a helicopter today is actually making any money or if they're just burning money. 
Um, I'm pretty sure they're not making a wonderful margin. Um, with new uh, designs, e little designs, we can bring down the operating costs significantly to the point where it's actually a profitable business. And we're in a business, we're not in the business of burning money. Thank you very much. Sebastian, you wanted to I would add? like to choose my question, please. Uh, will, will there be security checks before boarding? I like ah, this one. You are one. skipping the order, but go ahead. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, no, because uh, it's, uh, it's a point that has been not mentioned that much, and uh, I think it's a key issue. The first issue is that if we process this, uh, uh, let's say, passenger journey, if we process it too much, if, if we make losing time regarding the, the security uh, check-in, etc., we are going to kill the market before it starts. So, I'm sorry, it's just people will take a VTOL to gain time on a seamless journey. So, it, it should be our obsession to keep this uh, uh, goal in mind. And again, our proposal is that airport helps the industry on that point. Uh, the, the second one is uh, we have a program called Smart Airport. And the whole topic about this, um, this ambition to say we need to rely on biometric technology to provide a seamless journey. Because we will have to uh, control in terms of security people who are going into a vehicle who is flying. I don't imagine that everybody can take it like this. Uh, so, but we can make it in a simple way, in a seamless way. I think it's possible through biometrics, for other technology probably. But it's also a topic that we will, would like to challenge and test to be sure that we don't lose time in the middle of, of uh, all the process. If you think about an airport, you have a uh, safety control at the, the departure. You have immigration control with the police when you arrive or you depart outside of you. You have customs uh, on your arrival. How do we deal with all those control into this, this specific business? We don't want to be uh, just a replication on what's happening in an airport today. So I think we really have the occasion to, to build something new that will serve the, the airport industry and the traditional industry probably. Thank you for uh, for this, and uh, it's good I think to have covered uh, to have tried to cover this uh, this aspect also today. Target safety level for uh, parcels uh, deliveries in uh, in cities. Any uh, well, uh, I'm not sure it was as easy as that to answer to the question for passengers. But what about parcels delivery? Do we have something? Uh, any opinion on on that? Um, Volocott was not in the business of delivering parcels, but um, for the sake of argument, the ground risk is exactly the same. If you're living in those cities, you don't care if there is a passenger carrying aircraft falling from the sky or an aircraft carrying parcels. So if the operating environment is inner city urban, then the safety levels, I don't see why we should differentiate between what cargo is on board the aircraft. And other thing regarding the cargo thing is like about the drone. It's, one is about the safety, another is about the social acceptance. Because I, we can say that the flying taxi will not going to crowd your airspace that much, but if you give the freedom to the drone, they're going to fill your uh, airspace uh, in, in a very short span of time, and maybe in millions, not even in uh, 100Ks or 200Ks. So this is very difficult thing, and that's why I keep advocating everywhere that cities should, and even in the IAJA, that cities should be the decision maker for the airspace, not as a technical operator, no. But cities should have the authority say, as per the max optimized design, there should be only 10,000 or 5,000 at a time. Okay, you're losing money, but I cannot increase the number of drone in the sky. Thanks. Just to say that I have no indication anymore about remaining time, so need some help to uh, to tell me when when we are getting close 10 minutes thanks <laughs> thank you very much uh, china will china continue to dominate this sector is china dominating this sector yeah, I direct, but you one, yeah. <laughs> so i wouldn't directly comment on whether china is dominating the sector but a thought i would like to share there is like as an oem you obviously also look at how you can translate that you achieve in one country into another jurisdiction. And the problem that I see there, so if we talk about FA and EASA, even though there is a widening gap, slightly different approach, I think we are still having a same understanding of a safety culture, safety objectives. That's very much in our DNA. And um, 
Whereas I think with China, it's a slightly different approach. And I think everything that's happening there will be much more difficult to translate into other countries. And I think we should bear this in mind when we are looking at China. Thanks. I would also say that I, I don't share the view that China has a lead here. Um, as a matter of fact, I think if we're not talking about the general drone industry, if we're talking about urban air mobility, transporting passengers, um, then I would say with the SC veto in place, we are actually in a very good position in Europe to be in the lead of this new industry because we are the only place on earth where there is a clear regulation being put in place that we know what is this bar that we need to jump, how, how high should we aim for. Um, so I would claim that actually in Europe, and I'm not going to comment on the individual parties that, that are in the race, but um, I think in Europe we are actually in the lead. If I may, uh, I think they have an advantage uh, compared to Europe, and you probably know it better than I do, which is uh, whatever they regulate and they decide, they apply. And there is one single market with one single body. Whereas in Europe, we still need to articulate uh, those regulations to the different national authorities. And I think uh, we have seen it uh, a bit uh, during the day. Huh? How are all these regulations going to be applied uh, locally? And uh, what is the saying of the different uh, member states towards those regulations? And if I may, I think that is uh, one of the, we, we say diversity is one of the big advantages of Europe. Yes. Uh, culture, languages, yes. But in terms of regulation, I think that segregation and that articulation overcomplexifies and creates a, a slower speed on the execution. And I think uh, this is uh, something uh, that uh, we can see very easily. Uh, whatever decision is applied uh, or taken in China, the application is all across the board very quickly. And that gives them an advantage. Second thing that is more uh, socio-demographic, uh, uh, places like Shenzhen, the average uh, age of the population is 30 years old. If you compare that to the age pyramid in Europe, uh, it's pretty different. And the aversion to risk or the willingness to innovation is different in different generations. And the third topic is uh, most of European cities are usually uh, historical cities, monocentric. Uh, we have beautiful buildings that come from maybe the Romans or even before, uh, you know, or the Middle Age. A lot of places in, in China are being built uh, over the last 20 years. That means the provisions for infrastructure and, and the type of uh, urbanism that they can develop is also less constrained than the classical European one. But I agree with you. I think uh, we are in a very good position thanks uh, to the regulation that have been developed by ESA. I think we run the risk to develop technologies in Europe that because are not widely used in Europe, we will lose in terms of control. And the places that will open up the usage of those technologies, if they are not the leaders today, they will be the leaders in 10 to 15 years. So that is also a message important to Europe. If we develop technology here, we need to be able to use the technology here. Otherwise, we will lose uh, you know, the, the, the content and the knowledge. Yes, absolutely. That's why we don't need only the certification requirements. We need the, the whole framework uh, and all the enablers to, to make it happen here too. Yeah. Um, uh, let's group the, the two next questions. Any, any forecast on, on when urban air mobility may become uh, operational or commercial reality in Europe and in which part of Europe? Uh, Helsinki, Paris, Toulouse, uh, Amsterdam? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> to, to the poor. <laughs> Maybe the when is, is easier, the, the where. Oh, um. it. <laughs> Look, I, we are okay till 2030, but even uh, Airbus want to do in 2020 or 21 or 22, I won't mind, or any other Volocopter want to do before that or Boeing want to do before that, we won't mind it. Nobody goes for 19 or 2019. Uh, so, no, obviously that is not happening. So, what 
we don't understand we are talking about we are everybody is in hurry everybody you know like i don't know what pressure they are having uh investor pressure or uh, burning money pressure whatever pressure but if you really sensibly think about it do we, do we really need to be in hurry if even as a city i make a comment i am super you know super scared about the climate change i might stop using plastic no so and i agree with that at that point the hype mm -hmm. right now it's just that hype and hype and we and at least i'm happy about uh, all the city i'm working on as a community we city are thinking i am not using it i am not allowing it till the time you take 5 year or you take 10 year or you take 2 year we have a certain parameters at least in my community i am not commenting about the globe so when whenever uh, yaja said us it is certified everything is fine i said okay tomorrow uh, i don't know what the startups think about going slow so i'd be very disappointed if we have to actually leave europe go somewhere else to make this happen um, I, I sincerely hope that we will find an environment and we will find a city in Europe that is actually willing to pioneer this, this new um, mode of transportation. Um, on a global scale, I think there are sufficiently a sufficient, sufficient number of cities that would really want to be the first and that would really want to pioneer this technology. So uh, I think the challenge is out to, uh, to Paris to other cities to actually be the first, work with Holocopter to make it happen. Um, so for us, the next two to three years is when we expect um, to finish our development, certify the aircraft, and that would be the point where we can actually gradually go into service. Just as an anecdote, you know, I'm, I'm starting to be old in Airbus and I, I had the pleasure to see uh, six uh, first flights uh, in my life which is pretty awesome, you know, if, if you think about uh, how many programs are run every 10 years. And I learned something is uh, when, when the program guys uh, used to talk to the chief engineers and they say, well, are we ready to fly? The answer was, we have never been closer to fly than today. And if you think about it, we have never been closer to UAM than we are today. And that is the only thing that is true, you know. Um, I think there is the, the willingness of cities to be uh, innovative in the profile, and we can see that very well. There is also the element of economics. You can see who has money, who has less money. You can see uh, geographical needs, who has a coastline, who has rivers that can enable a different type of usages. Um, and I, I, I join your, your comment. For me, the question is not just when. That will happen. And if it's not in five years and it's in 10, so be it. And if it's 15, so be it as well. The problem is how do we deal with the economics uh, during that period? And uh, how do we sustain uh, the financial muscle that allow us to move on? You know, And I think that is important for the startups, but that is important for big uh, groups uh, like Boeing and Airbus, uh, where we need to give explanations uh, to our CFOs and to our shareholders. And I think this is where we need to dose uh, those expectations and be pragmatic, uh, but, but continue walking towards, uh, towards that. Uh, but if, if somebody wants an answer, we have never been closer than today to have UAM in Europe. Thank you very much. And uh, I would suggest that these were the, the last words uh, on this panel for, uh, for today. Thank you very much to all of you for participation. Thanks for listening. Thank you.